Well, today's lecture represents my attempt to give you some, of the, some idea of the kinds of things you can expect in, in this course in Introduction to Philosophy. Now, there are several ways to introduce any particular academic discipline. Uh, the first chapter of your textbook by Douglas Socio uh, offers several different angles on philosophy. He, he talks about areas of philosophy like logic, ethics, metaphysics, and such. He also talks about what he calls philosophical archetypes, people whose original and insightful viewpoints have been very influential on other philosophers, indeed on whole cultures. Well, my introduction today is going to focus on three philosophers who have been very influential, uh, but three philosophers who impressed me when I was your age. I didn't set out to become a philosophy professor, but, but when I began to read philosophy as an English major, uh, an undergraduate down at Sanford University, I was just almost immediately hooked. Uh, here were writers, some ancient, some modern, even still alive, who offered thoughtful treatments of the very best, of, of the very important things that concern me the most. And th things like, what is the best way to get the truth about the world, or, or what is human nature really like? Or how can we resolve all the complicated moral challenges that we face? So in hopes that maybe you'll be hooked by some of these same philosophers, I will talk about these three, uh, Plato, Rene Descartes, and Jean-Paul Sartre. And then when I finish my remarks, I'll ask you to divide up in some small groups and see if you can discover anything that these philosophers may have in common that might help us uh, articulate what philosophy as a discipline actually is. Now, the first philosopher lived in Athens four centuries before the birth of Christ. I mention that because even though Plato wrote several centuries before the founding of Christianity, his work has deeply influenced Christian thought. And you'll find several of his ideas seem rather familiar to you. In fact, no philosopher in the Western world has ever had greater influence than Plato, uh, uh, not only in Christianity in particular, but on Western culture in general. His closest competitors for that kind of influence are Socrates, who was his mentor, his most influential model, and Aristotle, Plato's best student. We will be looking at all three of those in the weeks ahead, separately. What I remember from my first encounter with Plato's work, which was actually in a world literature class in the English department, was his insistence on not letting the visible world be the primary focus of our attempts to get the truth not letting the visible world be the primary focus of our attempts to get at the truth. You know, in a scientific age like ours, that can sound rather odd. But it turned out to be a profound insight that sooner or later every good thinker must confront. There are two kinds of truth, said Plato. Some truth is about the kind of reality that's always changing. If you were to describe the academic quadrangle that's in front of this building, on a warm day like today, you'd include probably an account of all the lush green foliage that's up there in the trees. But six months from now, the leaves will be gone, and there may indeed even be icicles hanging from that limb, those limbs, as hard as it is to imagine. So, so the truth about the academic quadrangle will change because the quad itself will change. Indeed, two years ago, this room we're in did not exist, this whole wing. I mean, it did in, it exist in a sense in architectural drawings and blueprints, but the steel and the brick and the windows were not actually here in this place. Which leads us to this other kind of truth that Plato talked about the truth in ideas that are not derived from sense experience about the existing world. And it turns out this is a very large category of ideas. 
It includes, for example, the ideas people have about things they intend to build or make, like the architect's plan for this building. But it also includes other interesting ideas. Plato was impressed by the developments in mathematics. Pythagoras, uh, Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans who based their teachings on his ideas are, are known to every student of, of mathematics. Somewhere along the way, each one of you memorized the Pythagorean theorem. It expresses the relationship between the sides of a triangle. It says that the, the square of the hypotenuse, the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides, or A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And you probably worked that out in class. Now, here's the question. Where does that kind of truth come from? I mean, what kind of truth can it be that does not draw its persuasiveness from observations of the visible world. It draws instead upon abstract thought. It's not even clear that it should be called a logical truth, although that's debatable, even though many logical truths can be derived from it. Well, Plato was never really sure how to describe its origin. Sometimes he seemed to think that ideas like that may be in our minds when we come into this world, so that gaining knowledge is a kind of remembering of something that has been pressed out of our conscious thought. And other times, he and his companions pondered the possibility that mathematical truth is just a gift of the gods. But whatever the origin of mathematical truth, one thing was clear to Plato, it does not vary with the seasons. Does not change simply because of the way things appear to us on any particular day or in any particular place. And mathematical truth is not trivial. It's profound and it's useful and it may be the closest thing this world has to a universal language. Plato was impressed by the significance of mathematical truth, but more than that, he was impressed by the difference between that kind of truth and the kinds of things most people talk about most of the time. In the Republic, Plato provides a graphic illustration of different kinds of truth using the divided line. Later on, we'll draw that up here and install different kinds of truth in different places on there. On that graphic illustration, the highest kinds of truths are the truths that never change. And mathematical ideas are up there in the upper half of that diagram. In the bottom half of the diagram are the ideas that are based on the visible world. Now among those, the most real are the physical existing things in the world, people, desks, trees in the quad. Among the least real are the images of the imagination. You know, a reflection of a person in a still pool of water has a certain reality to it. But the reflection is not as real, we would say, or as changeless as the person whose reflection it is. And so he establishes this hierarchy of things that are more real and things that change quite often. And when he assigns names in the lower part of that diagram, he uses words like opinion and belief and imagination. And when he names the ideas that he puts in the upper parts of the diagram, he uses words like truth, knowledge, reasoning. Now, what Plato eventually does with that division of truth becomes more controversial as he applies this rubric of ideas to morality and politics. But it doesn't diminish the profound insights he recorded 2,400 years ago about the truths that do not change. 
The second philosopher who sealed himself into my memory as an undergraduate was a French philosopher from the 17th century. Rene Descartes is sometimes called the father of modern philosophy. He was also a mathematician. As a matter of fact, he played a, a major role in the development of modern mathematics if, as we know it. If you've ever graphed Cartesian coordinates, or if you've ever studied analytic geometry, perhaps you may be doing that now, you've already benefited from his work. Descartes shared many beliefs in common with Plato, and he developed some of Plato's ideas even more fully in ways that have affected Christian thought. Most of you in this room are what we would call in philosophy Cartesian dualists, whether you know it or not, even if you never heard of it. We're going to talk about that this semester. If you can quote Descartes on anything now, that may be his famous line which he wrote in Latin, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. And we'll talk about that later too. But what I want to mention in these remarks is Descartes' influence on rational thought. The modern period is often said to begin as the age of reason, you know, leading into the enlightenment, labels for every period. And Descartes, along with Immanuel Kant, was one of the chief architects of that period of a different way of thinking. Like many other people, Descartes was impressed by the agreement among mathematicians compared to the disagreement among others. Why is it, he asked, that mathematicians have agreed on a great deal for a very long time? And philosophers and theologians have been working for centuries and don't agree on anything. What's wrong there? Is it the nature of the subject matter? That's a person's common response. He says, no. It's the way that the thought is ordered that makes all the difference. Descartes, the rationalist philosopher, epitomizes logic. He says you should start your considerations with sure, irrefutable, self-evident truths. Something that is so clear you don't even have to prove it to anybody. As a matter of fact, you couldn't doubt it if you wanted. That's where he winds up going with that part about his own existence. He's sure there's no way to doubt his own existence. And so he uses that as a foundation stone and tries to build a system of thought on it. His first two works were named Rules for the Direction of the Mind and the Discourse on Method. And in both of those books, or his first two philosophy books, in both of those books, he undertakes to explain this method. He says, first, doubt. Doubt anything and everything you can. If there's something in your accepted body of ideas that is uncertain, toss it out and start over. Because the only way you'll have sure knowledge is to have intentionally constructed rational knowledge, starting from what you cannot doubt and adding only what can be added with absolute surety. The light of reason lets you know there is no way to doubt the second step or the third step or the fourth step. And you shouldn't keep adding until you can see the whole rationale in one single mental glimpse or glance. Then if you'll consider all those relations and all the holes, you'll have a rational account of the truth. Now since Descartes, many people have done that in philosophy and theology and have constructed what they think are airtight systems of truths all related in some way. And we'll see some examples of that later. So from Plato in ancient Greece to Descartes in modern France, we go to the 20th century, uh, also to France, to a French philosopher that we know as an existentialist. His whole life lived in the 20th century, Jean-Paul Sartre. He is, in many ways, I believe, the ultimate modernist. And his main theme is a popular one. He writes about freedom. Now, Descartes, uh, uh, Sartre was very impressed by Descartes. 
he was convinced that this focus on, on careful thought and on introspection as a source of truth was something we ought to claim for ourselves, that you cannot find the truth that really matters out there somewhere. You're going to have to find it in some other way. But even more important than dealing with the difference between the external and internal standards, Sartre focused on the fact that in this life we must <coughs> act. We must do things. And in acting, in doing things, we construct ourselves. We are not created by another, we create ourselves by what we do. The most telling story about that is the advice he gave to a young man who was caught up in the difficulties of the Nazi occupation of France during World War II. The young man faced a problem. Should he stay home and care for his elderly mother, or should he leave her on her own and join the French resistance to fight against the Nazi occupation? And it was not just a personal choice. It was a choice in which he was not sure what the criterion of the choice should be. How do you make a choice like that? How do you choose between your mother and the problems of this foreign occupation of your own country? And what Sartre said to people like that is, nobody else can give you an answer for that. There is no dependable external source of morality. There is no rational method like that that Descartes would propose that can help you with this. Ultimately, you must simply choose. In a world where much of what we study is studied from the angle of science, we see things that come about not through their own choosing, but by the mechanisms of life or the mechanisms of a physical universe. But Sartre, like Kant and Descartes and so many before, was convinced the human mind is not like that. The human mind is free to choose. You can't fall back on any excuses about, well, I was raised this way. Or any excuses like, well, human nature is such and such, and therefore I have to choose this way in keeping with human nature. Sartre says there is no human nature in general. In general. There is your nature and your nature and your nature, but nothing that we can say is there in common that determines us. Human nature will, on any given day, be the sum of what humans are doing and what they have made of themselves. But tomorrow, it may well be different. Now, on the one hand, everybody likes what Sartre says about the freedom you have to do anything. It's a very inspiring account in the several different ways in which he delivers it. But he doesn't deliver it always as just an inspiring message. Sometimes, he says, you are condemned to be free. And by that, he points out, you don't have any excuses. You can't blame it on nature or human nature or your upbringing or any circumstances. You are absolutely free this day, this hour, to choose what you're going to do. And when you choose, you will thereby construct your own self. And that will make you who you are. And if you choose differently tomorrow, then you will be different to the extent that you have chosen in that particular way. Now Sartre, by the very nature of what he's doing, you can imagine, is not informed by religious belief in any significant way. He found late in life the, the legal and moral traditions of Judaism to be interesting, but claimed to be an atheist all the way to the end. We are self-creators, not the object of another creator. Now, I should point out that not all existentialists shared that perspective. The existentialist who gets the biggest coverage in our book was a Christian, Soren Kierkegaard, a Danish philosopher in the 19th century. He inspired Sartre as well. But his version of existentialism was, was aimed at criticizing the kind of the cold, heartless, rationalistic version of Christianity that he saw. Christianity, he said, is not about establishing rational theologies, listing your fundamentals and deriving the, the implications of those. Christianity is about passionate commitment of your whole self, just like loving another person. And in a lot of his accounts, his, 
his failed intentions to marry his, um, his beloved uh, sort of got in intermingled with his own grappling with, with how he understood faith to be a passionate commitment, not just cold repetition of somebody else's words uh, in, a, in a setting that he found uninspiring. And so while he criticized Christianity, he criticized the contemporary practice of Christianity and became, as an existentialist, the first truly important existentialist, also a, a great advocate for passionate Christian commitment. So when we get to the existentialists, we'll see that kind of variety, uh, but they will have in common that choosing. And so we have these three. Plato, who understands there are different kinds of truths, some that change and some that don't, and we ought to figure out how to get to those that don't change and use them as our model. Descartes, who was convinced that the way to do that is to construct a rational, logical system of thought with every logical connection checked and rechecked, tossing out anything that can be doubted at all. And Sartre, who says, rationalism is not going to do it. Look within. But you must ultimately choose on your own without any excuses. And that will make you who you will become. So in days ahead, we'll look at those, but on our next lecture, we're going to look at Socrates. On the first lecture, we're going to look at the man Socrates and what he did that inspired Plato and Aristotle and so many others. And on the next lecture, we'll come back and look at some of his important influential ideas in their own right and how they've traveled through Western philosophy to this day. Well, good, thank you.